This is a carbon dioxide molecule, CO2 for its friends. CO2 is made up of one atom of C, carbon, and two atoms of O, oxygen. The history of CO2 is as old as that of the solar system. After the death of an ancient supernova, somewhere a cloud of particles produced by that explosion start to condense. The particles come closer, compress themselves and heat up until the central core lights up. The Sun was born. At the same time, asteroids, planets and the Earth are formed. Carbon remains trapped within the rocks and is partly heated and erupted by volcanoes in the form of CO2. It is thanks to this that the heat of the Sun and the Earth's core make this place so warm and comfortable maybe a bit too warm. In the comfortable primordial environment kept warm by CO2 that restrain the heat of the sun and of the Earth's core, begin first random experiments by continuously reshuffling molecules, broken and reformed by the heat and the ultraviolet rays from the sun. One day, one of these groups of molecules manages to use heat to break the bonds that trap carbon inside the CO2 to obtain atoms to be employed as the bricks required to grow. Among all these experiments, one grows so much as to be able to divide and multiply while maintaining its original characteristics so as not to lose the progress made up to that point. And this is the beginning of life. Evolution proceeds until a group of molecules stops using heat, preferring sunlight. In this way, it can take carbon directly from CO2 and use to build many other things, sugars, cellulose, but also amino acids, proteins, and DNA. Photosynthesis is born, and the evolution continues, until someone starts to exploit all the effort made by plants to steal the organic matter already produced, the first herbivores. And then, even more cunning animals emerge, the carnivores. Soon after, a similar process begins on the surface. Plants are formed, and herbivores and carnivores start to populate the planet. The CO2 disintegrated by plants to obtain carbon is exploited by herbivores and carnivores, and, at the end of their lives, all of them decompose, freeing the carbon and forming new CO2, a virtuous and effective cycle. When a living being dies, all the carbon that forms its tissues is slowly released into the air in the form of CO2. But does all the carbon return always to the atmosphere? No. Sometimes, an organism dies, leaving its body trapped in layers impermeable to air and other organisms. In these cases, the carbon contained in them remains trapped between the rocks, and slowly, the deposits of coal, oil and natural gas are formed. This is the beginning of the Carboniferous period, around 300 million years ago. The formation of these fossil fuels requires, on average, 100 million years. In their own way, also these could be considered renewable sources, if you have the time to wait. The first human use of fossil fuels and their direct transformation into CO2 dates back 6,000 years. The Sumerians, Assyrians and Babylonians learn to recover the bituminous fraction of oil that emerges in puddles along the banks of the Euphrates. In China, 3,000 years ago, coal is used as a fuel for the smelting of copper. The Persian priests of the cult of fire are the first to observe fugitive gas ignited perhaps by lightning and to create altars for their divinity. But the real boom in fossil fuels takes place with the invention of the combustion engine. Oil becomes the true leading actor of history. This is the Industrial Revolution. Reserves accumulated over hundreds of millions of years have been burned in the last 150 years. And we have released large quantities of CO2 into the atmosphere. Its concentration increased from 280 parts per million at the end of the 1800s up to 400 parts per million today. If, in the past, CO2 retained the heat that we needed to feel comfortable on Earth, now its effect has almost doubled, and we risk getting very hot in the near future.
The world has four alternatives to choose from. We could do nothing, we'll be warmer, and we can merely hope that our children and grandchildren will be able to survive. Hmm, let's try another one. We could ban all fossil fuels and give up the energy produced from them. But we would also have to renounce all of our technology. Perhaps this is not the best solution. We could try to rely entirely on renewable sources. Actually, no, we couldn't. Unfortunately, today, we can cover less than 20% of our energy needs with renewable energies, and 80% of these renewable sources today are not even high-tech, such as solar panels or wind farms, but low-tech. We burn wood or convey the water inside turbines. We still have much to learn before we can invent new ways to exploit renewable energy and completely replace fossil fuels. The only viable solution is to find a source of energy that allows us to manage for a few more years while we wait for the scientists and engineers to play their part. But this bridging fuel is already available. It's natural gas. This is the fossil source with the lowest environmental impact and for the same amount of energy produced with the lowest emission of CO2 into the atmosphere. Coal, for example, produces twice as much.